Everybody could get their seats. Are there any other empty seats? Okay, we have one right here in this second row. We have one right there in the back next to the gentleman with the white sweater. Uh, we have a seat up front. Okay, I can feel the anticipation in this room. It's wonderful. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have a couple little housekeeping issues, and then we're going to get started with our honored speaker, Mr. Chris Taylor. First of all, um, I saw my mayor. Where is Mayor Mark Frazier? Okay, Mayor Mark Frazier. Um, North Beach Mayor, because we have two towns here for those of you who are visiting today. Then I see one of our town council members, Greg Dotson. And then from Chesapeake Beach, I see town council member Stu Combo. And are there any other elected officials here from... Oh, I didn't see you. Hi, Glenn. Stand Hi, up, please. This is Glenn Chiara from the town of North Beach. Anyone else did I miss? Okay. Welcome to North Beach, the jewel of the Chesapeake Bay. Welcome to Chesapeake Beach, because in this area, we consider ourselves the beaches. Welcome to Calvert County, and welcome to Southern Maryland. The event today is being sponsored, and I'm just going to ask them to stand for brevity. Uh, would all the members and volunteers of the Bayside History Museum please stand? We have our director of the Calvert Library, Carrie Flymeyer. So could we have all of our members and volunteers of the Calvert Library please stand? And our former director, Pat Hoffman. We also are co-sponsor today. Uh, for those that are not from this area, we have two wonderful small museums in the beaches. And our other sister museum, the Friends of the Chesapeake Beach Railway, are co-sponsoring this event today. So can we have our railway museum people stand? I'd like to thank Jerry, who's standing to my right. Uh, he is a certified ASL interpreter, and we really appreciate his taking his time today to volunteer his services for our event. <laughs> Two housekeeping issues. Please turn off your cell phones. The second issue is restrooms are located on the first floor and on this floor. So, um, if anybody needed a drink of water, we have water fountains on both floors and restroom facilities. Okay, much awaited. A real pleasure today and an honor to introduce someone of the caliber of Chris Haley. He's a leading field of genealogy. He's an actor, a singer. He's a historian, a producer, a director, a motivational speaker, and a radio talk show host. I've never known anyone in my entire life who wears so many hats. <laughs> One of the things that we hope to accomplish today and to bring awareness of, Chris is here today in his capacity of the director at our Maryland State Archives and he's the director for the legacy of slavery. So as he talks today about genealogy, it is very important for everyone to make that connection that if you have any records at your home, please make a copy available to our state archives. There are so many people that are trying to find their roots and their genealogy, and he is the repository for all of those records for our African American community. So we're very lucky to have him. Without further ado, big hand, Chris Haley. Hi. I just want to make sure this is, I have, I have theater training, so I'm trying to make sure that you can hear me anyway, because I, I do have a tendency at times to move toward the screen. And, and, and not really just for emphasis, just because I might not be able to see it. <laughs> so I'll just move over there. So I'm hoping that my voice is loud enough, but I've been told by the Honorable Mickey over here, who's our audio video tech today, that I should not move. So uh, in that case, I will be using this, this very uh, uh, luscious 
gift, which is, I think it's the mayor's. Is this yours, Mr. Mayor? So I know I have to give it back for security. <laughs> uh, that, that, the, the fabled red marker. So see the red, the red goes on there. Now what's scary about this for me is that as a speaker, it's wonderful to have a red pointer because you don't have to walk over there. But at the same time, it shows that we as human beings, we are never exactly still. Look at this. I'm trying to hold it. Oh my goodness. I, this <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Did you see this? But what I was going to show, is it on? <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I might need two because I get kind of animated. You know, the point is that as, as steady as I'm holding this, it still looks like I was just drinking, doesn't it? <laughs> it's crazy. And this is really just water. I don't know. But this, just so you know. Uh, I just want to also acknowledge a couple of people who are here. Uh, the Vice Chair of the Maryland African American Heritage and Cultural, uh, Cultural Commission, Commissioner Lendra Pat Marshall is here. She say a word. Very happy to have her here today. And is Margaret Land here, an instructor with Plum Point Middle School? She's not here. She was able to get me, not able to, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But she uh, asked me to speak at Middle, Middle, Plum Point Middle School back, I think it was March or April of last year. And, and that was just a wonderful experience. I spoke with, I think, about five different classes. And I think one of those students is here. Is Dia here? Yes. I thought you were. And this lovely young lady is with, is with Plum Point Middle School. And she actually asked me questions. And she, she's just, again, up, up and striving young person of Calvert County, so please give her a call. <laughs> and so that I can also give credit and if possible ask advice, I want to acknowledge one person especially who, who will hate this because he is such a shy person. But believe it or not, I have been in the archives now for 20 years, 20 years as of December of 1993. Uh, the picture that you saw of me, although I had a lot of hair, it was dark and I was stunning. <laughs> that was really only four years ago. I, think I, was just doing I shaved my head first because the, you can't really see the gray so much because I shaved it away. But those 20 years, my first supervisor at the Maryland State Archives, the person who basically taught me most everything I know about how to do research today is here, Pat Melville. I do anything right, all, no, never mind. <laughs> so, um, part of what I'm going to talk to you today about is the legacy of slavery in Maryland, and I'm going to try to focus somewhat on Calvert County and also Plum Point. Specifically, this is only to be about a 45-minute talk because you guys are also supposed to be able to ask me questions or make comments, what have you, and, and as you know, there's no way you could talk about slavery within any county, with any city, any state within 45 minutes and be in any way exhausted. <coughs> so part of what I'm going to try to do for you today is, is share with you some, some points I feel are important and also try to share with you some, I hope, evocative moments, and please check your dictionary if I said if I used it right, uh, evocative <laughs> moments of, of examples that we found at the Maryland State Archives that I think bring to mind how important history is. And how important history is not only for our ancestors, uh, but how important it is for ourselves today, but how important it is for those who come after us. That is what is so incredibly uh, a gift for any of us who take genealogy serious, seriously, such as my uncle did, certainly and any of us who take history seriously, as many of us here today, and certainly in the Maryland State Archives do. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a term I just came up with, quite frankly, as I was making up this presentation, because although it might be, I would say, relatively speaking, easy, quote unquote, when you give a lot of talks, to give the same talk over and over again, because as you keep giving it, you'll get better and better at it, it'll just fly right out of your mouth. I always feel it's very important and also helpful for me 
to try to, to alter it depending on where you're going to be, the audience you're going to speak to. And so even though this talk is about the history of slavery in Maryland, focusing on some aspects and some uh, residents of Calvert County, I also feel that history is always about ultimately genealogy. And that is to say that if in any situation where you talk about history, there are individuals. And any individual, be they Brad Pitt, be they Angelina Jolie, be they President Obama, they are a person. And there was at one point when they had a mother, they had a father, they had a grandmother, they had a grandfather who did historic things. And those people can be followed through just as well as the Civil War can be followed through, just as well as the War of 1812 can be followed through, just as well as any event can be followed through to present day. So I think it's important and perhaps not as daunting if we also think of history as being a gene genealogically based type of history. So that's why I say today that what we're going to discuss today, what I hope I leave you with today so that you can go further on your own, is the G of history, which is the genealogy that is inherent in all of history. Have you done your G today? Next slide. One of the reasons I feel like it's very important uh, that within my department, which is again the study of the legacy of slavery in Maryland, uh, to, to get the facts out there about slavery in Maryland and when appropriate slavery in the United States of America. And that is the, to, to differentiate between the mythology and the fact. And that is to say that there is much that is said about slavery which is awful, which is immoral, and that is very true. There are also variables within that that affect our history, that as we, as I say, we can tell affect us today. And so it's very important as we go through these presentations, myself and my staff, that as much as possible, you bring out what you know as being fact, you bring out what you do not know as being fact, but, being, but has been spoken about very often, and just acknowledge the two. One of the things that I found very interesting when I first got into the field of, of history in Maryland, I have always been interested in African American history, uh, and I think even before Uncle Alex became so big, I was always a big fan of black history, was that when I came to Maryland, again, that was probably 20 years ago at the archives when I caught on to what it was about this state that was significant, I did not know that Frederick Douglass and Harry Tubman were both born in Maryland. I truly did not know that. I thought that they were people who inevitably must have come from down south. And down south not being Maryland, being Georgia, being the Carolinas, being Mississippi, being from the places that were famous from the Civil Rights Movement of the 50s and 60s. That must be where they're from. And then I got here, and when I started going through the records, and it was just Wow, how is that not one of the most known elements of African American history that, that people in Maryland own up to, which is the fact that, that two of arguably the most iconic figures in the struggle against enslavement were born in Maryland in two neighboring counties, Talbot and Dorchester County. I, I, I was stunned by that, and that's one of the things I always want to bring up when I do have presentations, whether they be for adults or whether they be for children, because these people are part of your heritage being a Maryland resident. Now subsequently, as we know, Frederick Douglass had his home in Washington, D.C., Anacostia. Subsequently, uh, Harriet Tubman went to Rochester, New Auburn, New York, where she passed away. That is, quite frankly, let's say, the, the end of their story on Earth. But the beginning of their story on Earth is in Maryland, and that's something I think is always so important to let us all leave here with that knowledge if nothing else. Next slide. Yes. Historical. One of the things I mentioned about is being fact and being fiction. It's said in many books, it's, it's said in many uh, secondary resources that Harry Tubman went on 19 trips into the South and rescued approximately 300 people. Next mm -hmm. slide. We were able to find in a, in a newspaper ad in the Maryland State Archives, dated June 5th, 1860, this, this advertisement. 
It's not really an ad. It's, it's quite frankly a brief review. And what it says is this. A female conductor of the Underground Railroad at the late Women's Rights Convention at Melodian Hall, Boston, the most interesting in incident was the appearance on the platform of the colored woman, Mrs. Harriet Tupman. Now, I says Tupman, but as we know, talking about for errors, even then. <laughs> who has been eight times south and brought into freedom no less than 40 persons, including her aged father and mother, over 70 years old. She had a prolonged and enthusi enthusi enthusiastic reception. Eight trips and over 70 persons. Now, do I know literally how many, how many trips she took back here in the room? Literally, no. Do I know specifically that there weren't many more influence than the 70 individuals? Because people talk, people hear, people have, would have heard through word of mouth what route might have been taken. I do not know these things. But I know from documentation that was written in the newspaper based on something she apparently said, it was eight trips and over 70 persons, uh, or over 40 persons, over 70 years of age, her mother and father. So I think that is very important to recall that when we talk about uh, Harriet Tubman or whatever facts or history that there is out there. Spend a moment or two to look beyond the inflammatory headlines. And I so mean that about today. Look beyond the inflammatory headlines, because sometimes there's more to it before you get on and blog something which you'll regret later. Uh, next slide. What we have been involved with over specifically about 10 years at the Maryland State Archives is this department uh, that I oversee. <coughs> and it began and it is sustained through many grants, federal grants and also local grants. We have one now actually from the, from the county of Dorchester, in difference to two we have from the Department of Post, for Education Post-Secondary specifically to study the Underground Railroad. This is a panel that we have um, created, which is both traveling and static, which means that it could be, it, it's one panel that stands about seven feet tall, and you would actually have that at a specific institution. It could be here. We also have one that's static, and no bigger than some of these um, portraits here, which, it, which those five are at the Reginald Lewis Museum. Represents, again, such like this talk, it's just a microcosm of what we've done, a microcosm of the research that we've, we've tried to do over the course of these 2005, 2000, 2000, well, 10 or so years, which is to try to bring to light the lives of free and enslaved African Americans and those who engaged in their lives, whether they were the enslavers or, those, or the ones who tried to free them from slavery, so that is saying that it's white, black, Indian, what have you, over the course of these years. And what we have used as our primary sources for this information have been the newspapers throughout the state of Maryland through that time period, and also the federal census. The federal census, again, is something that any of you sitting here today, and any of you later on who get my lovely voice on the video and my face, you can look at yourself through Ancestry.com, through Heritage Quest. There's so many different ways, again, today, that you can do some of the research that I'm going to show you. What we have here as perhaps a way that at least we thought of to break down the story in these panels. Flee, slave holders, fugitives, accomplices, poor freedom. Flee basically being that as Henry, Henry Highland Garnett is a, is a well-known, I mean for some, a well-known abolitionist, and it says specifically, this is his quote, in every man's mind, the good seeds of liberty are planted. That's it. From the beginning of enslavement in Maryland, from the beginning of enslavement anywhere, <coughs> chances are, think of yourselves, chances are you want to get out of an, in, an untenable, untenable situation. And so there was always that seed of some individual somewhere who wanted to escape being in bondage to another man. So that's setting up the premise of this study. Here we have slaveholders, the second panel. The moral condition of the Negro was slavery. There an infirm race and should be subordinate to the white man, Curtis Jacob, a slaveholder, to say, yes, let's, let's face it, there was a different point of view. There was a point of view that perhaps enslaving this race was good for them. Enslaving this race 
was helpful to them because they could not take care of themselves without our, our um, management or our guidance. There was that point of view, and it's good to face that, to acknowledge that, because within a genealogical book at history, as slavery in Maryland, as well as the United States of America, you cannot deny that many of the, the leads that will take you to someone's past will be through the person who enslaved them. Fugitives. Fugitives being, there's that, in, that initiation, there's that feeling, there's that, that drive that you want to escape this, and then you do. And when you do, you are a fugitive. You have broken the law. And so that's what's inherent in this, as Frederick Douglass's quote says, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Better even to die free than to be slaves. And that is part of what our story is. It wasn't just about Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. It was about all of these people, many of whom are probably related to you sitting here today, all of these people who fought enslavement, whether they, whether they succeeded or not, they probably did something to try to get away. Accomplices. It wasn't just about those who actually took the step. It was about the person who gave them that clue, who gave them that hint, who said, maybe on this day, maybe on that day, who said, this is what happened to my cousin, who now is in a free state in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania. There are those people. And those people were very close to equally uh, in danger because of the bravery, because of the courage they employed themselves to, to take this journey to help someone else who was in a worse situation than they had, 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 had existed in, but they risked their own enslavement, or they at least risked their own imprisonment and also some very hefty fines to help someone else find their own freedom. And toward freedom, um, bury me not in a land of slaves, Francis Watkins Harper, a, a Maryland poet. Basically saying that, that once the abolition of slavery happened in 1863, once the abolition of slavery occurred here in Maryland in 1864, then there's that different world that you inhabit. There's that different reality you have to, you have to, uh, you have to absorb and you have to accept and that's when these different races, which for whatever reason, be a uh, financial, economic, or sociological, now you live together as free people. What has toward freedom done for you? How does it change your look at life? How does it change the history of Maryland and or Calvert County? Next slide, please. This is our website. That's, we just changed it to that HTTP colon blah, 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 <laughs> so just so you know. But if you were to say legacy of slavery in Maryland, you should get to the over, you should get to this site. If you look down to where there's the, the different one, two, three, four uh, thumbnails, so to speak, all that's very big on the street, but really thumbnails, like a whole, whole hand. Uh, how have we broken this down? Case studies, a featured case study, interactive maps, search database, which I encourage you, you all to go to at some point because it's, it's, again, the point of this is to bring to life the lives of those who aren't taken for granted, so to speak. Those who are in our own history who made that leap of faith so that you could be here today. I mean, that's really the reality of it. And those case studies are, in essence, small biographies. And I'll, saw you, I'll show you in just a moment what they stem from. And partially what they stem from are these runaway ads or committal notices, or domestic traffic ads, which give names, which give descriptions, which give rationale for why a person would run away, which would give descriptions of perhaps where a person might run to. A featured case study is just what it says. I mean, there might be one that we try to promote up at the top of the page to, for, for whatever reason, just randomly, because it is the, the I think the, the best part about this program, I think, is that we did a random search of these records, which is to say we weren't looking for just something about Frederick Douglass. We weren't looking for just something about Harry Tubman or Benjamin Banneken, Banner, or Francis or Rockins Harper, because we knew there were so many other people who were unknown who contributed. And because of that, there are so many references to people 
who you may not know are in there who may be, who may be related to you. Uh, slavery database, that's where you would find the names of those individuals. In coming months, hopefully within one month, the information that we have put together uh, with four to six staff members and I think 12 interns for the last three years, we should be able to incorporate that within to our database, I would say by the end of February. And that will roughly be at least hundreds if not thousands of more pieces of information. Roughly at this point, I would say, and this would include names, um, descriptions, any type of identifiable information about a person. We, uh, it's been said by our IT staff that we have about 300,000 bits of information. I'm saying bits because, again, a name, a statistic, mm -hmm. black, male, uh, 30 years of age, uh, within our database. Much of what I'm going to show you today is, again, just the tip of the iceberg, is just by putting the word Calvert into this database. <clears throat> we have not even touched Calvert specifically as one of our targeted counties. So what I have today is literally by just randomly pulling things out, cross-referenced from other counties that we have specifically targeted. Interactive maps, that's a best one. Interactive maps, because we want to, if, if at all possible, show people where some of these persons live and where some of these events occurred. Because again, if we put ourselves in a historical mindset, then what is today in 2014 what was it in 1814? What did Calvert County look like in 1814? What was 260 in 1814? What was Route 4 in 1814? What was Plum Point in 1814? What, was, what did it look like? When we see references to these areas, if you can imagine, it happened here. Just quickly, because I know, I know you all know this. <laughs> 1663, Leonard Calvert, brother of Second Lord Baltimore, Cecil Calvert, sailed to Maryland. He's a younger brother. Now you can think about all your sibling things. It's like, the, the, the second, and I'm sure Pat knows this much better than me, so the second Lord Baltimore, Cecil, for whatever reason, you know, I got things to do. Little brother, you take yourself over there and you see what you can do about this Maryland and this county. You get it going, but I got things to do. It's probably rough over there, so you go over there. So Leonard goes over there on the Ark and the Dove with about a hundred or so individuals, immigrants and also higher ranking land uh, persons who were let's say to some degree the gentry, people were better off, and he became the colony's first governor. Now within this first time period, which is roughly 1634 to 1664, slavery was not the law of the land. It was not something that had, was something that every black person automatically was considered enslaved. That did not happen until 1664. Those who were servants were indentured servants. They could be black, they could be white, they could be Indian. So in that sense, they could be of equal status. It wasn't until 1664 when the law was specifically put in place where those of African heritage could be enslaved through dura, dura vinte, or vita, which meant for life. So just, it's only 30 years, but I think it's very important when we think about the formation of our, of our state, how it began. Now, one thing I wanted to bring up is that from the records we have, this, this fabrication, because we don't know what this person looked like, is that one of the two people of African American, of African descent, not African American descent, but African descent, uh, who according to the ledger were listed as being mulatto on, or Portuguese on the Ark and the Duck. And that was one was Matthias de Sousa, another was named Francisco. Francesco, and it only said a mulatto in parentheses. Now, what I think thought-provoking about this is on these two ships, there was this first governor. On this ship, there was this indentured servant, Matthias de Sousa, who became actually a Maryland General Assemblyman. Now, we don't know much about him after that, but this is a person who was an indentured servant of African descent who actually became someone who could vote on the Maryland General Assembly. I wonder, I don't know, and I don't think it's written anywhere, if Leonard Calvert saw, in any way communicated, had contact with all of the people on the Ark and the Dove. I, I don't know that. I don't know, I just don't know. 
But did he have contact with this Matthias de Sousa, who ended up being a general assemblyman uh, at the beginning of Maryland's foundation? Was there that connection? They were on the same two ships. There weren't that many of them. There's more than 100 people here right now. Are we making contact? I don't know. But I think that's something that one wonders because this person who was an indentured servant ended up being on the General Assembly. Next slide. <clears throat> something that's very important and one of the things we always do want to bring out as far as when we talk about slavery, slavery was big money. When we talk about it being immoral, it was immoral. It was awful. It was something that had gone on since the beginning of time as well. And America, what made it keep going were different factors. Part of the factor was that it was big money. People became wealthy beyond their, it's hard to say, how wealthy they were because they had enslaved other human beings, which also gave them status. If any of you have seen 12 Years a Slave, some of the things in, in that movie are very, I'd say, it, it, they really bring to mind, I feel, what slavery was like, more so than many other movies. Even, even in Roots, because there's times when Roots goes to a very, very dark place and it leaves very quickly. I don't know if you have seen 12 Years a Slave or not, but I know there is one section where there's something that happens to the lead character and it lingers and it lingers and it lingers and it lingers. And to me, that was the most uh, effective part of that whole movie because during the time of slavery, you couldn't just break away. It wasn't that you were whipped or you were punished and then next day you're up with your kids and you're doing this, you're doing that, it's okay. You were punished and you were in that punishment for a time. And also the people who were around you could not help you or that they would be punished themselves. And that movie brings that to mind as much as anything I've seen. So again, just to bring to mind, Today, related to the past, 1860, near the, near the advent of the Civil War, right when, when, the, when the whole conflict is going to take place, just a thought. The average, according to the SAMRestingWorth.com, there's a variables about this. But $800 in average cost for a slave in 1860. Using MestringWorth.com, which you can all get to, $17,000, $100, that's the equivalent today. The value changes over a lifetime. As I said, uh, it's to some degree, again, it's, it's harsh, but it's true. You think about property. You get a car, you're not getting a car just for that day. You're not getting that car for just one trip like renting a car. You're getting that car, you hope, for a little while. So the amount of money you pay for that car, whether it's 10000 20000 you get a Mercedes Benz, <laughs> you get something like that. You want that car to be with you for a while, and that's how you justify, if you ever justify, paying that amount of money. Many times when someone, when someone purchased a slave, they were thinking not about this slave just this day or just this one crop. They're thinking about this person who I will have in bondage is going to work for me, is going to produce for me for year after year after year after year. And that's how they're viewing it, and that's how the value of an enslaved person was even more than one might say that $800. Again, judging just perhaps the general lifetime, it goes from age, sex, skill, childbearing years would be what is looked at. If you are 20 some years old, a male, you're a very valuable commodity indeed because you can work the field, you can work so many different things, and you can do it for probably at least 20 to 30 more years. If you're 20 or so years old and you're a female, you can do some chores around the house, you can do some chores on the field, and you can give me more slaves to do more work for me. Childbearing, and then if you have a special skill, if you're a carpenter, if you're, as in roots, if you're a fiddler, if you have some other skill, that also changes and alters your marketability. So even though it does say $800 uh, for 1860, just this, just keep in mind that just like things we would buy today, depending on the variables, that amount of money that you would sell or buy in the slave person for also changed as well. Next slide. 
And this is what I used when I was at Plum Point, just to give, try to give for, for people who are younger, uh, just a sort of a, a mind uh, fact check, just something to say, okay, what does this mean today? How can I relate it? Okay, so $17,100, what does that buy you of the things that we get all the time today? An iPhone, an iPad, a computer, an Xbox, 32 inch TV, which is pretty, I mean, that's pretty, I think, um, moderately a uh, luxurious item, only 32 inches. A car, $30,000. So roughly two slaves could have been the equivalent of a, of a pretty good car at that point. And again, that's, that car, you figure five years, six years, you're looking at a slave for a lifetime, 20, 30, 40 years. And if it's a woman who can also give you more. Homes. Now just so you, this is from, from the, the, the website here, City Data. 2012, Coward County, $390,000 is the supposed the median sum for some houses here, and but nationally $189,000. So again, the amount of enslaved individuals you have could be the equivalent of, of a home today. Next slide. Some of the stories that we get into, again, bringing out what, what is unknown, but reminds me, it reminds anyone I think who looks into history, and I do mean whether it's slavery, whether it's war, whether it's re revolutionary times, is that people were people, no matter what. And that the same feelings we have of envy, of jealousy, of love, of hate, of revenge, of, of, of frustration, those are the type things that, that people had then. The situation, the parameters were different, but you still have these, these feelings. This is an individual, again, we just found him randomly going through our, our ads. $100 reward, a Negro, Negro girl named Cinderella, about 22 or 24 years of age, very pleasant when spoken to, light complexion, four, or five, four feet five or six inches high, took with her a variety of clothing. She has run away. She has a husband living with her in Baltimore by the name of Abram Brogdon, who was supposed to have taken her away. He is a free man. So again, this is part of the, the, the intricacy, the complexity of enslavement then, that sometimes a free person could be married to an enslaved person, and that did not mean that all was right with the world and they could live together. And so even in that situation, if that free person tried to free their own spouse, they were breaking the law. And that's what happened to Abram Brogdon. He was put in jail for being found guilty of accomplice to slave life in 1848. Now, what was amazing about this specifically is that because of access that he got to people he knew as a free person, he was able to get the community behind him, a white and black community, that they, that they petitioned the governor about his situation, basically saying that he was trying to free his wife. This is not something for which he should be jailed. This is something that we think he should be, he should be pardoned. And subsequently, he was pardoned from this act. I think, I don't remember exactly, uh, he, was, he was jailed probably for a two to four years. But he was actually free because of a mixture of white and black persons who petitioned the governor for his freedom. Now, the sad part of the story is that his wife had been found, and she had died by the time that he had been released from jail. Next slide. This is, again, things that we hear about, but we don't see any example of it. We find this. Now, um, again, I'm trying to give you these dates, too. 1841. Now, can anybody read that? Because I know it's kind of broken. I can read it myself, but after a while, you want to hear a different voice. It has so many different elements in it that I love it. Having found no volunteers, you can read it from back there. Yeah, I think so. Love it. Okay, go ahead. Um, Five dollar reward caution. My daughter Zippy Jones, having on Thursday night last, without my knowledge or consent, got married to Wiley Bailey, who had already two wives living, and I, fearing that she will leave here for the north, this is to caution all persons connected with the railroads not to take her as a passenger, as she is not free. She is of a yellow complexion has a large head of hair and a flat nose. Bailey is an old dandy, um, also, also has a flat nose. If any person will return Zippy to me at the corner of Argyle and Fleet, I will pay the above reward. Robert Jones. Thank you. 
Ariana on Free Street. You can go there today. It's in Baltimore. Doesn't look the same, as far as I know. <laughs> but, but anyway, to me, and again, this is randomly looking through ads. What 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 I found very interesting, and and also validates what you've heard is that this person, this Robert Jones, is talking about who? He's talking about his slave, who is who? His daughter. That's who he's talking about. And, and within that, he says why he thinks she might have run away. He says with whom she might have run away. And also, there's the complexity and the, um, the thing about, about this situation, and I'm calling the slavery, the peculiar institution, where it's like, you're property, but you're a person. What is he really so upset about? Is he so upset that his slave has run away, or is he so upset that his daughter has run away with an old dandy? Both of those elements are in there. I just think it's fascinating to see this. And again, randomly out there. I have not been able to find, like Robert Jones in 1840, uh, I haven't found his census record to know if there was a, a young lady there or not, or in 1850, if there's a Zippy living with a Wiley Bailey. But those are the type of questions that this brings up for me. Uh, next slide, please. This is another one. Again, I, I, I so often find within these, when, and just randomly searching, what comes around goes around. Who, who wants to read this one? Not All right, go ahead. Uh, was committed to the jail of Baltimore City and County on the 23rd day of September, 1851, by D.C. H. Wardley Esquire, a Justice of the Peace of the State of Maryland, in and for the city of Baltimore as a runaway, a Negro man who calls himself Mary Ann Waters, about 28 years of age, five feet, two and a quarter inches high, stout built, very black complexion, and has a seer on his left ear. Wow. Scar, thanks. <laughs> that Negro had on, when, had on when committed a dark figured did like, oh, thank you for the French folks here. <laughs> dress, dress blue velvet. There you go. White satin bonnet and figured scarf. Says he is free, was born in Elkridge, and has been hiring out in the city of Baltimore as a woman. Okay, the last, thank you. <laughs> the last three years. The owner of the above discount Negro is requested to come forward, prove property, pay charges, and take mid Negro. Set me for away. Otherwise, he will be discharged according to the law. So, you can count him in of the Baltimore City and County Jail. I, you know, I mean, it's just something. Was I looking for that? No. It's just, it's just you think about what goes on today, you think, oh, my God, that never happened back in the day. And here it is, and what I, what I, I also, and I know I have to move along because I want to get to some Calvary County issues, too. Or not issues, but, but as. But, but what, I, what I think is very telling, again, we're talking about a person who might be property, who might be money. If you look at that ad, do you see any, any editorialized comment or, or I think the right word, um, let's say slanted presentation of Mary Ann Waters? Is there anything there that says he is anything other than a man dressed as a woman, this is what he's wearing. There's nothing there that, that puts a, um, a point of view on it. And today, everything that's out there is like, this is this, and this is that, this is that. But here is something that's in, in, the, in the newspaper in 1851, and it's like just the facts. I think that's something that sort of boggles my mind beyond the fact of what's in there. Next slide. Okay, this is just to remind us where we are today. AD 65, uh, a, a Simon Martinet map, and this is from uh, the old Calvert County map here. I, I borrowed it freely online. Uh, Virginia, I think it's Reinecke, uh, said copyright to her, so I, I clearly say that because it says you could not use this without her permission. So I wanted to make sure I put that there, so if she's here, may I have your permission? <laughs> Having not heard your said no, I <laughs> but just to remind us where we are. I mean, there's North Beach, where we are today, Chesapeake Beach, Plum Point. And remember up here, uh, I think it's right here, it's Anne Arundel County, 
Prince George's County is around here. So remember, there's Lower Marlboro, Upper Marlboro in that area. Next slide. This is, again, just to remind us where we were, where you are. Slavery ended in Maryland in 1864 because of the passage of the Maryland Constitution. Look at these stats based on the census from 1790 to 1860. Roughly what you find here is that Calvert County, for these very, very important and, I would say, inflammatory building years for the Civil War, Calvert County is roughly half and half, black and white, throughout this whole time period. There's 1790, 8,600 citizens in total, 4,300 of them are enslaved. In 1860, 10,447 persons total, 4,609 are enslaved. Virtually that whole time frame, this is a very mixed county racially. Also, it's very important to look at from 1840, 1850, 1860, the amount of free blacks who are now in Calvert County. At least 15 to 17 percent of the blacks and Calvert County during the time of enslavement were, were free. So it's not that you can just walk around Calvert County at that time and just assume that well, there's a black person there slave. But you know, every eighth, ninth, or tenth black person could be free. Now what's, I think, important to also see about this, this is the vote that was used to pass the Constitution. Passage of the Constitution ended slavery in Maryland. Calvert County here, now again, look at all this, which, which says Calvert County is very, very mixed the whole time frame. And the, and the vote, Calvert County, 57 were for the amendment, which is, again, ending slavery. I can't read that, but <laughs> we're against it. That's it. Okay, next slide. Okay, one point, some of these I mentioned before. And, what, and since I am running out of time, I want to give you guys a, um, a chance to ask questions if you have any. Is that why I bring up some of these ads, and I brought them up at the Plum Point Middle School as well, is to think about yourselves, to think about your families, to think about surnames, to think about your history. Because I find so often in, in communities and different counties that people have relatives, have homes that span the years and they may very well have someone who was here back in the 1800s or in the early 1900s. And some of the names in this ad might be names of your family, be they white or be they black. I mean, and here it's Candace and Martha Wilson. There's a story in here. She ran away from the subscriber, Martha Wilson, at Plum, living at Plum Point, Calvin County, Maryland, Easter week. Her name was Candace, 23 or 24 years of age. Very specifically, who is Candace? What does she look like? How tall is she? How she has a dull, stupid look. Excellent house servant. Particularly good cook and wash and ironer. Ironer. Her clothing not recollected. She is supposed to be in Baltimore, so Martha thinks she might be in Baltimore. A reward of twenty dollars if given in Calvert County and the above. Fifty dollars in 1832 would be thirteen hundred dollars in 2012. I looked in an 1830 census for Martha Washington. She did have a free colored person, free male, one who was between 24 and 35 years of age. Was that Candace? I don't know. The name isn't there, but that's a possibility. <coughs> Next slide. Nancy and Miss Betty. This is Calvert County near Huntington. She says here, Betty, it's at H. Beckett. Betty and Nancy run away. They are sisters. Betty had, Betty had come 19 years of age. She had come from Montgomery County last May. Apparently, this is a scar over her right eye, which, caused, which causes to be more prominent than the other. She tries to hide it. She, she had lived in Annapolis, neighborhood of South River, moved to Montgomery near Clarksburg. Nancy's a sister of Betty's not above 14 years of age. So again, there's so many facts about these individuals, so many facts about Betty and H. Beckett. Connections between Calvert and Huntington, between Montgomery County, all in that time frame. And when I looked in an 1810 census after this has happened, 
we see that female 45 and over there with you. Perhaps that Miss Beckett is one of those. She has 19 slaves in 1810. In 1800, did she have two more? Next slide. Here's one that's kind of, that, that again, I think is amazing, but then you don't know what happened. Was committed, committal notices. Committal means basically that someone was free, could have been free, could have been a runaway. The sheriff found them on the street and put them in jail. Put them in jail because they had the right to do that. And then you would have to have a certificate of freedom, some way to, to prove that you should not be in jail, to prove that you were a free individual. So it says here, to the jail of Calvert County as a runaway, the 9th day of July, by James Dixon, by Joseph Brown, who says he was born free. He's about 15 years of age, four feet four, five inches high. Pretty short, 15, four feet four, pretty short. Scar on his left cheek, one on the left side of his neck. Has on a pretty, I think, pretty decent outfit. Linen shirt, trousers, country cloth roundabout, old fur hat. Francis Stevens, Sheriff of Coward County. So we've got a James Dixon, who's an Esquire. We've got a Joseph Brown, we've got a Francis Stevens. This is 1834. I looked this around a little bit. 1830, there's a Joseph Brown in Annapolis. Of course, we're very close. We've got a male who's between 55 and 99, who's free. We've also got a female between 55 and 99, <coughs> who's enslaved. There was a law where if you have, if you freed some individual, who even could be your family member, within 30 days or so, they would have to leave the county. I think it was around 1831 this happened. I don't remember specifically. So in this home, total only two persons. So are they this married couple where the husband is free, the wife is a slave, that's the only way they can stay together? Did they by any chance have a grandson named Joseph Brown who had already run away? Who, who knows? I don't know. In 1880, I find, however, a Joseph Brown who's 60, who was born around 1820. If in 1834, Joseph Brown is 15, he was born around 1820. He's living in Calvert County. He has a spouse named Ellen Brown. He's a laborer. Is this Joseph Brown in 1880, this Joseph Brown who said he was free in 1834? Uh, next slide. And this is just briefly saying what, what a committal law meant. And I'll just go briefly into it. 1802, within 15 days of committal, this notice had to be put by the sheriff. If after 60 days the fugitive had not been claimed and her fees associated with the copper and corruption race and had not been met, the public sale of this public fugitive to the highest bidder with an auction to commence within three weeks of the announcement. However, that person, if he was purchased, could not take that, that free or enslaved individual out of the state for two years. Why? Because that allowed another owner to still come in and find this person. Because again, the, the uh, contradiction or the, the complexity of this is that even if a person is is, slave, is enslaved and we think it's wrong, there's somebody else, you can't just snatch this other person's slave either. Because even if you are another slaveholder, if you take, if I, if you own this car and I think that car looks like mine, I'm going to take it. But no, that's my car, now you've broken the law. So I mean, that's how this was very specific as to why you had to wait for two years for that matter. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are just some other names I want to mention. Hillary is a big name I found on the, in Prince George's County in Upper Marlboro as far as the slaveholder goes. There was a Bill here whose name was William Brooks, called himself William Brooks. He ran away, had relations in Blaisburg, in Baltimore, and in Plum Point. So because within this ad, it, it, it implies Mr. Hillary thinks that he may have run to any of these any of these places because he had relatives there. That two hundred dollar reward there worth roughly fifty four hundred dollars today. Next slide. He had eighteen slaves, Mr. Hillary, in eighteen fifty. Next slide. In eighteen forty, he has twelve. And what I noticed here is that if you look, three white persons. There's three there. Slaves, males. Slaves, females, now look, slaves, females, there is a category for 24 to 35, there's two. Males, there's no one between 24 and 35. Is that the individual who ran away? Next slide. Plum Point John and Mr. Ireland, again, I put this up there just, for, again, for names. Ireland, is that a name that resonates with anyone here? 
Uh, is Galloway a name that resonates with anyone here? A Negro man, he has a wife and child in Baltimore and is likely to be lurking about there as he was seen with his wife on Sunday. The above reward will be paid if taken out of state and $100 if taken in the state. Plum Point County, Maryland. Now let me just, and he's 33 years of age again, dark, colored, very stout, very specific as to who an individual is in these ads. Next slide. Just to show you other things that we have in the archives which you can look through, we looked through War of 1812 uh, records to, to because it was War of 1812, but that was a big anniversary within the last few years, because many African Americans sought to, to enlist run away with the British when they came over here. Because obviously, they're, they're enslaved here. The British are saying that we'll free you if you fight for us. So many ran. There were claims against that by those owners. Some of them we have for Calvert County. Next slide. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but this is just, it's on our website, you can get to it. So it's just a, just, just a thought. Does anyone, these are the slaves who ran. Uh, a Caden, a Coates, a Cornelius, a Covington, a Dare, a Ford, a Gray, a Green, many Greens, a Gross, another Gross. I mean, there's so many names here. Are these people who could have related through the years to you? Are these people who ran away from Calvert County, who had a Calvert County history, are they related to you? Next slide. About 1864, when, when freedom came specifically to Maryland, blacks were allowed to fight in the Civil War. So as, after they fought, subsequently there was a pension allotted to their descendants, sometimes to themselves. It took many years for this to take place when it did take place. But, next slide. Within this, on our website, you can get to this U.S. Colored Troops Pension Search you will see a listing of the different individuals for whom we have pension records. Many of these have come from the National Archives, but we were able to get copies of them through an agreement with them. But they are, uh, I think, virtually all the different counties in Maryland represented, including Calvary. Next slide. There's many more than this, but again, I just want to throw some names at you. This is a James Brooks alias, oh, Broom, alias James, I can't remember. Boone. Here's one for a James, is that Bowen? Bowen. Bowen. And here's another one for Madison Herschel? Hansel. Hansel. See, I read perfectly well. <laughs> but again, other names, other records out of there, which tell so much about their whole family history, because these people were trying to get the money due to their ancestors. Next slide. Sorry, I'm taking my slide. That's our website again. That's what the building looks like. One more slide. This is why I had you fill out that, or if you have, I hope you have, <laughs> if you fill out the letter. Excuse me. Which is to say, remember at the beginning of this, virtually at the beginning of this, I mentioned about Leonard Calvert, and he was on this, one of these two boats. There were about 100 or so people on there. Among them was, was Matthias de Sousa. Did he know him? I mean, the Ark and the Dove are, it's so important to the state of Maryland because that is our, our history of who were our first immigrants from England to settle this state. Two of them were of African descent. So just, just to think about history, did Leonard Calvert ever see Matthias de Sousa? Did they ever cross paths? Who knows? So today, January 19th, 2014, this is a room of, I don't know, 160 or whatever people in here. You all have different last names. You all have different last names which are by your father, which are by your mother. You're all here today in North Beach at the, at the, the, the town, town hall. We're at the town hall. We're at the town hall. We're at the town hall. <laughs> We're at the town hall. And so, and you're all here at one time. Many of the documents we have at the Maryland State Archives go back through the 1600s because records were kept. Many of them are ledgers, very old, dusty ledgers with handwriting no one can understand. But that is the documented history that we have that you can hold on to, that you can look at, and that's your forebear. That's, I was living in Florida 20 years ago and I looked at a runaway, I looked at a census record in 1860 and I found Tom Murray in there. Tom Murray, my descendant 
on my mother's side through Roots. And believe me, it was all I could do to keep from shouting out, oh my gosh, I found him. <laughs> but it was there because there's documentation. You don't think it, we take it for granted, but I say to you, years from now, hundreds of years from now, 50 years from now, there will be someone doing genealogy, doing family history, who will look for anything that has your name in it, who will look for anything that has something that we don't do all the time except on a check, is a bit of our handwriting, something that we actually did. And so there will be a ledger that was stored by, I don't know, the library at the town hall. There will be a, a ledger, the museum, that's right, the museum, that, that, that has a documentation of a Linda Pratt Marshall who was at this building between two and three at North Beach at some occasions where a nephew, because there's others, I don't want to get beat up, <laughs> where a nephew of Alex Haley was speaking about history, was speaking about, and so someone years from now will have that piece of history that documents you, their great-great-grandmother, you, their great-great-grandfather, you, their father, you, their sister, you, their brother, you, their cousin, that will document you at a place in time doing something with other people from who knows wherever. And that's why I wanted you guys to sign that book, because you guys are a part of history today, because you're here together. You're in one place. And how many different talks, how many different concerts, how many different events do you go to where if you thought for a moment, who is that person sitting at the back of the room in the corner? I wonder if I have any connection, six degrees of separation, to that person. I wonder. How many people in here have, when, when I don't know how we're going to make that, that ledger available. But I would, I would challenge you, I would encourage you, that if this ledger can be made available, the names on that ledger, with the counties, with the states on that ledger, that if you see a name on there with a surname that is similar to you, and it's not the person you came with, then I challenge you to contact that person and see if somewhere down the line you might be related. Especially if that person also has a Calvert County relation. I have a relation in Ireland now because I took a DNA test. And that's something I never would have thought to do, but now I have it. This is an opportunity because of this book, because of what you guys have done, that years from now, when we won't even be aware of it, you will make someone very, very happy that you have a piece of your essence here today. And not because I'm a big deal, whatever. <laughs> But just because you will have documented yourself at a place, at a time, in Calvert County in January 19, 2014. Next slide. Oral history, you got to talk about stuff. Records, that's how you verify stuff. DNA, that's the extra element we have today. And then what do you do? You talk about all that other stuff. Thank you. If somebody asks me a question or owes me money, then I'm not supposed to repeat it here. Okay, she didn't say them owes me money. Threw that in there. Yes. Um, I have a question. I didn't hear any mention of the Indians. Mm -hmm. um, when did they come to Maryland, or were they here before? You know, in what else was? Well, I, I didn't mention it because there's only so much time, <laughs> and. Um, that's right. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Uh, you owe me $50. No, uh, the question was, I, she didn't hear any mention of, of Indians when they came here, how, how many were here, what have you, and, and, and you didn't hear it because I didn't say it. I mean, that's why you didn't hear it. Um, but I, and, and it, I do not know specifically about that history. I, knew, I, I know that, uh, that Native Americans, Indians were here, they were in this area, Piscataway, I mean, there's, there's the Savoy is a very, po a very, um, I wouldn't say popular, like, oh my God, Smith is a popular name. But, but a, a very 
Prominent. prominent name. Thank you very much. A very prominent name of, of Indian descent, which is which is included among documents about history in general. And and I there's some boys today who are of Indian descent who speak to their heritage here. So I mean, there's ways to look at it, but it, it's quite frankly, it's very, it's much more challenging to find Native American history in Maryland as, as elsewhere than it is. I mean, as hard as it is for African American history, it's even more challenging for Native American. History. And the reason why I ask this is kind of a follow-up because um, throughout my history, I'm from Calvary County and I'm a Parker, and there's so many Parkers, you know, and everyone used the same, you know, first name, Benjamin, yeah. Benjamin, Benjamin, and that's where my, my lineage falls, but I was always told that, you know, we had Indian um, heritage in our family, but we could never trace it back, so I just didn't know how true it was. Well, I mean, as far as genealogy goes again, there's a... Uh, the, the term mulatto, uh, we take to mean almost the first blush, mulatto means you're mixed black and white. Mulatto, the further back you go, mulatto could mean, quite frankly, that you're lighter skin. You're black, perhaps, you're Hispanic, perhaps, but you're mulatto because you're lighter skin. It could also be, be used for someone who's of Native American background. There are some, and this is really going further back, it's not the, it, it, it's more the exception than the rule. So depending on what, what what you're looking at, what names you're looking at, I will look very closely at the, the racial designation of that person. Because it's not always going to be W, B, or M, which is white, black, or white. There are some times when it does vary, and that's what you should look very closely at, at those occasions. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, were slaves allowed to take any last name, or did they generally take the name of their former master? Well, I, hmm, allow. Um, what, what I have found is that the Union troops would come into a certain place, come to a certain plantation where they had taken over, and they were, they were basically like, who is the master here? Who is the master? Who is blah, blah, blah. And so that answer would come out, and then they would, so they had to sort of denote who are these people, who are all these free people now? Well, they are the Robinsons. They are the this. They are the that. So that might be how they were initially given a name. But subsequent to that, it, it, from what I have found, it certainly was uh, a, a black person certainly could have adopted another name. Now what I have also think, which again, I haven't in any way exhaustively researched this, is again, think about yourselves today. If someone has been mistreating you for years and years and years and beating you down and selling your people and this and the other. So once you're free, are you going to adopt that name if you have the choice? Or are you going to look for another name, a Lincoln, a, 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 some name you feel better about? You know, Parker, you know? <laughs> I mean, and, and so that's why I, I certainly do not feel about the I do not take it for granted that uh, an enslaved person will always take the name of their enslaved. Yes? And you showed the 1864 vote allow blacks to be free. Calvert County was seven to one pro-slavery. Do you remember what the breakdown roughly was for, say, Calvert, I mean, for Charles or St. Mary's? Because they were so strongly aligned with the Confederacy. Right. Did the vote reflect it as well in those counties? I, I don't, I don't remember. I mean, but it is, or I mean, that's something that... Put the slide sorry. back up. <laughs> Are we able to get this one? But the, the other key thing about that is that 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 vote did not pass initially. It passed because federal troops' votes was brought in subsequently. So initially, the vote did fail. So in other words, slavery, if it wasn't for the votes of the federal troops, slavery would not have ended in 1864. Now remember, Baltimore City, as far as you can see, Baltimore City is represented here. Baltimore City was quite frankly 10 to 1 free to a slave after that. It was very much more free blacks than a slave blacks in, Africa, in uh, Baltimore City at that time. Prince George's County, however, had the most, it was pretty much 10 to 1, if not 12 to 1, enslaved African Americans in Prince George's County to free African Americans. There's another question. Yes. Uh, are you from Maryland? And if I was, so, I was born in Washington, D.C. She's asking if I was from Maryland. Today I was, but you uh, still Boston, live in. Do you live in Maryland? I, I live in Landover, Maryland, near the Redskins. 
<laughs> and I thank you all for being here today. I know if they had been playing, maybe you wouldn't be. But <laughs> maybe next year. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Hey, how are you? I, I introduced you before you weren't here. Margaret Land. I'm who sorry. Me to the Hi. Um, by the way, when Chris came out to present to my eighth graders last year, he did an amazing job. They were engaged and exciting. And I guess my question is, you use those same primary source documents for my students to do a historical investigation where they analyze the primary sources and in, in a local context. Why do you think it's important that students learn about the history of slavery and to include that in, in the curriculum and social studies? But did, did everyone hear her? <laughs> She's got very good <laughs> elocution <laughs> here. Uh, well, I think it's very important for, for kids to know uh, to know to know history to know that that there's that there's facts and there's documents to support what a teacher and an instructor might say because I think so many times and I know this, obviously we we remind our kids that that mommy and daddy were kids just like you they were your same age and they wore clothes like you and there was there was a, you know there was some pop star back in their day too is that I did not think beyond what my teacher told me or what was in a history book. And after a while, you know, the history book gets boring to you. And you, you, you think, I'm looking at this history book because I have to pass this test. I have to get this exam because my parents will be upset with me and I won't get my allowance. Oh my gosh. So, but if you show them that there's a document that is going to be here forever, and this document not only has this fact, but if you remind them that you already have a document about you, there's something called a birth certificate that has your name on it. You seven-year-old, you eight-year-old, you ten-year-old. There's a document that's historically significant forever. There's a census record in 2000 that you, nine-year-old, that you, eleven-year-old, you are on two census records. That is history forever. If you remind them that you are already a part of history that's documented with your having to do nothing but be alive, then I think it, 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 is import, it puts importance to, you, to your students that everything I do could be everlasting. Everything I do could be significant. And so let's see if this thing that, oh my God, Miss Lamb has made me study this thing for the upteeth time. Let's see what's real about it. Let's see what maybe I might find interesting about that that Ms. Land didn't even bring up to me. I mean, I, th that's what it does for me, is just to go to an actual document and see it beyond what's in a book which somebody else wrote and beyond being what, what, what our instructor had to digest all this information down to present to us. Like, I digested a lot of stuff in 30 slides. There's something else that I can look at and nobody else can tell me how to read it and tell me what to think about it, but this is something that in the library or online, I can look at myself and make my own decisions and my own determinations about it. I think if you can in any way impart that with your children, then, then they should at least get a B. <laughs> uh, any other questions? How was that? Thank everyone for coming today. Our next lecture will be on Sunday, March the 2nd, and it will be Dr. Ralph Eshelman uh, talking about all the steamboats and wharfs that were in this area. Again, I want to particularly thank the North Beach Beach Patrol for setting up all of the room, taking care of traffic out front, and directing everyone to a place to park. Those guys are awesome. I want to thank Mickey for doing our video work, the Calvert Library, the Friends of the Chesapeake Beach Railway Museum, and the Bayside History Museum for sponsoring this event. And if you have more genealogy questions, the Bayside History Museum has a genealogist on staff. She's available on Sundays and glad to help you. And if you specifically have donations and you've done your genealogy for the African American, 
please get a copy of it to Chris at the State Archives. And thank you for coming.